All right, well, real quick um, moment of transparency. I'm not really that into astronomy. Um, I, I appreciate the moon and the stars, and, you know, I'm, I'm glad it's all there. But I don't really keep up with it that much. Um, it's just not that interesting to me. In fact, a couple of years ago, when these, um, remember we were having all these blood moons? Um, I was thinking, man, this is about to be spectacular. And so my dad happened to be in Denver at the time of one of these, supposed to be, you know, the big one. And um, we were driving around 2, 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning, whatever time it was. It was stupid early or really late. I don't know which one. But we were like, okay, here's the time. And we look. I mean, it, maybe it was a little orange. Certainly wasn't red. Definitely wasn't blood red, and it was small. I'm thinking, I mean, if God was going to give us a sign, might need to be a little more than this. And maybe it'd be a good idea when other people were awake so they could see it. <laughs> but be that as it may, that's all just to say, uh, I'm not the most discerning about the stars. So I tell this story, you, you kind of, that's actually important to understand in me telling this story. So the other day we were, we had finished our series on our identity in Jesus and we were getting ready to start our series in Revelation next week. And that means we had this week where we didn't have something from the week before and we really couldn't get into something that would be the next week. So here we are and I didn't really have a, I didn't have a direction. So it's Monday. I normally do um, sermon prep on Tuesday, Wednesday, and so it's Monday, and I have no idea, I go through my series of meetings, have no idea what I'm going to be doing on Tuesday, I go home, I'm a little bit frustrated, I lay down to go to bed later that night, and still really have no idea, I'm kind of thinking about it, but I don't know what's actually about to happen, and so I just go to bed, and at 3.17, when you are someone like me who looks at the clock a lot, you remember the, the times when you get up and when you go back down, it's just... It's, an, it's a sickness. Um, and so 3.17, I get up and I'm like awake, awake. Like not just go to the bathroom, come back. I'm awake. And so I just go outside like I normally do when this happens. And I just go outside and I pray. I'll just pray. I'll just meditate. I'm not out there forever. I'm not out there for even a very long time. Maybe 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour. I, I don't know. I just, if I feel just sort of impressed to go pray, it's necessary to go pray. And then for those of you who you spend a, lot, a little bit of time in prayer, you'll sort of know what I'm talking about here. I'll pray about one thing, and if it just doesn't seem like there is much interest from heaven in that, then I'll move on and pray about something else. And then I'll pray about something else. And sometimes I don't have words to pray about things, and so I'll just pray with my spirit, and I'll just pray mysteries, and I just sort of wait, if you will, for God to sort of inspire my prayer so I don't feel like it's just me hanging out with me. Um, no inspiration. Like nothing. I sit down, I meditate on the moment, like nothing. Um, but I guess I should bring this up. When I went outside at 317, the yard was like lit up. I mean, it was super bright. Like, really, really bright. I'm looking up thinking, you know, maybe something's going on in the neighborhood. There's a chopper. Like, something is bright. But it was just the moon. The moon was the brightest that I have ever seen, probably because of that time in the morning. I'm usually not paying attention to the moon. But it was ridiculously bright. I get done praying. I go in, I'm going inside, and I'm just like, well, you know, Jesus, I'm not going to say that was a waste of time. But I didn't feel a whole lot of inspiration. And then it just seemed like in the moment that Jesus just wanted to wake me up to show me the moon. And so I go on inside and I lay back down and it's 444. You know when you get up and you know when you go back. And um, so then I wake up and... I tell my wife, I'm like, you would not have believed the moon last night. It was ridiculous. She goes, yeah, it was probably the harvest moon. The heart, what was the harvest moon? What even is that? So, of course, I don't believe a word she says. I Google it. 
I don't know how you are with your wife. That's how I check my wife. I Google things. And you know what I find? It's a harvest moon. So then, I don't know how discerning you are, but it just seemed like if God woke me up to see a moon, because there was something about that moon that would be inspirational, it seemed like it might be a good idea today on this day to talk about harvest. Because I believe that there are probably many of you in this room who you have spent time sowing. You have spent time seeking. You have spent time waiting. And for you, I just want to let you know it's harvest time. To you, I just want to let you know that all that you have sown, that it hasn't been sown in vain because in the name of Jesus, it's harvest time. So go with me to Mark chapter 4. We're going to begin reading in verse 26. And Jesus said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe at once, he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So let's just talk about this unique moment where we're living in right now. You know, it's easy to look around and see all the chaos. It's easy to look around and see all the dissension. It's easy to look around and see all the confusion. And when we see all the confusion and the dissension and the chaos, we just think everybody has mad. Everybody has lost their mind. People are getting on my nerves. I don't care if I see one more person. I don't want to have one more stupid conversation today. Maybe that's just me. But when Jesus looked out and he saw people who were hassled and he saw people who were scattered and he saw people who were without a shepherd and he saw people who were hopeless, what Jesus said was this, the harvest is ready. The harvest is ready. And so I just want to remind you of what the harvest actually looks like. I just want to remind you that in this moment in time where we see people who are confused and they are lost and they don't know if left is right or right is left. They don't know what's going on. They don't know where true north is. There is within us the answer. There is within us the direction. There is within us a call to step into the lives of people when they find themselves lost. We say, I know the way. And if you'll just follow me, then I will lead you to the one who will save you. I will lead you to the one who will change your life. Because it doesn't have to happen. It doesn't have to look like this. And so when Jesus looks out over our time in history, what he sees is that the harvest has come. And so let's talk about this idea of harvest for a minute because it begins with some sort of language that we're not always as comfortable using. It said the kingdom of God is as if, especially in Christian circles, we don't like the ifs. We really don't like the idea of if something is right or if something is wrong because we think we know exactly what is right. We know exactly what is wrong. We know exactly what God wants to do. We know exactly what God is going to do. We act like we know everything. But the kingdom of God is as if. We have to learn to embrace these ifs that we don't always fully understand. We have to embrace these ifs that we're actually called to live by. Because life doesn't just happen perfectly the way that we want it to happen. We don't just experience the goodness of God just because God is good. We don't experience the amazing presence of God just because he's promised us his presence. There are ifs that we have to live by if we are going to experience harvest. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 19 says, If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Now that doesn't mean if you're willing to eat the good of the land, you will. Or that if you're obedient to eat it when it's in front of you, you'll enjoy it. That's not what it means. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. That means if you're willing to hear the voice of God, if you're obedient to the word of God, then you will eat the good of the land. If, if I'm willing. I'm sometimes willing, or at least I say I am. But obedience can be um, 
It can be a chore sometimes. Sure. And other times, I'm really ready. Like, I want to obey God. And then he says, okay, do that. No, no, not that. I'm, I want to do this. I promise my obedience to do this. Yes, but are you willing here? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm willing and obedient here. Yeah, but are you willing and obedient here? See, God actually does like to mature us. God does like to actually stretch us. God does like to actually call us from one place of glory to another place of glory. But we have to be willing and obedient. John chapter 15 and verse 7, it said, If you abide in me, Jesus said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now here is where I sort of just conflate the gospel. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, I will take letting his word abide in me mean that I'm abiding in him. But but here's the conflict, because here is how I find many times his word abiding in me. I'll be going through life, and there will be some kind of a need or a conflict. And I need a promise to um, remove the conflict. So I will go to the word to find the promise for the conflict. Then I'll let that word abide in me. What determined what word abides in me? The conflict. But he said, if you abide in me. Not if you abide in the conflict and find the word for the conflict. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. That means that when I'm in him, when I'm in the spaces where God has called me to be in him and in that place receive the word, am I willing and obedient to the word that I heard abiding in him? Because sometimes they're not the same. The gospel is the gospel is the gospel. It's all the word of God. But give me this day my daily bread means that there is a word for today. And the word for today is found in him, not necessarily in the middle of my mess. Now here's why I bring this up. Because when the word if is used, that means it is required of us to find the will of God in the moment where we are and not just assume we know it already. Let's look at, look at it like this in, in Luke chapter 5 and verse 12. We see this interaction. Jesus was going from city to city to city. And it said when he was in this city, there came a man who was full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged. Now, I don't know about your prayer life, but if it's like mine, sometimes I can get confused in my prayers where I feel like if my prayer sounds too desperate, then there's not enough faith in it. Because if I had more faith, I wouldn't feel so desperate. The man was full of leprosy. He was desperate. Because he was full of leprosy and he was desperate, he begged. His prayer was the outflow of what he was dealing with, and he was very honest before God. Faith is not hiding your feelings. God knows how you feel. I just want to make sure we all understand this. We don't need to clean up our emotions before we go to God in prayer. God knows us. He knows the fears we're struggling with. He knows the doubts that we have. We don't need to act like we can clean it all up and then get in his presence and and kind of fool him. The man was full of leprosy. Therefore, he begged. Well, children of God shouldn't beg. Well, listen how he begged. Lord... What does that mean? It means he's a child of God. You don't call Jesus Lord except by the Spirit. Nobody calls, nobody says Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit, John said. So what did he say? Lord, what's the first begging word out of his mouth? Lord. That means you are, I'm not, I love because you love first. Lord. Lord. Then, then here he goes. Listen to this prayer. If you will. Hmm. 
It's interesting, he didn't just assume he knew the will of God. It's interesting that he approached God in relationship rather than in pride. See, the one who approaches God in pride, God says, yeah, I I resist the proud, but I give more grace to the humble. Humility is just leaning on God and asking Him and not assuming everything. So He says, Lord, if You will, You can make me clean. I love the faith in that. He knows God has the power to make him clean. He knows there is no other way except God's way. He knows that he can't take another step in health unless Jesus does something miraculous, and Jesus actually can. So he recognizes the power of God, but he's willing to, by relationship, ask to understand the will of God. God, will you do this? Now, let me just say, we are a faith church around here. We don't pray for people that are sick and say, God, if it's your will will to heal them, heal them. If it's not, don't. Those aren't the prayers that we pray. That's not. When somebody comes up, we don't believe God made you sick to teach you anything. We don't believe that God just struck you down with something to try and show you what you didn't know. So let's establish that. First and foremost, fully, God is good. God is powerful. But his prayer didn't take away from that. His prayer was, God, you can. Now I just want to know if you will. I I just need to know, will you do what I know you can do? And then Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I will be clean. And immediately, his leprosy left him. And here's the thing. Was it ever not the will of God to heal someone? Did Jesus ever say no? Jesus never said no. But we do need to understand that at another depth that sometimes we're not always willing to recognize. So when I was in the fourth grade, um, I went to a private school in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and in chapel, we were uh, going over this book, How to Be Led by the Spirit of God, that was written by a preacher named Kenneth E. Hagan. And in the fourth grade in chapel, usually that was just an opportunity to sort of take a nap and just take a break from your academics. Um, They judged me a little at 9.30. Thankfully, you guys understand that in the fourth grade, I mean, you're just lucky to be there, much less actually paying attention. And so there I was in the fourth grade, and, you know, my my parents know what's going on, what we're studying. And so my dad, he sweetens the deal. He says, I will pay you to read this book. He incentivized my faith. I know sometimes parents are like, well, they should just do what they're told to do. I mean, you know, they don't have to make everything. Well, you know what? You wouldn't go to work if you didn't get paid on the backside. There's no way, there's no way you would put up with the nonsense that you put up with at work if there was not a paycheck on the back end. You know, <laughs> you know always just, yeah. So I appreciate that my dad was willing to incentivize my faith. He was willing to say, I will pay you to read this book. And it was a very simple book. I read it in the fourth grade. I understand. I understood it in the fourth grade. But there was a certain principle that was in that book that alongside of faith, there is this notion of having a relationship with God so much so that you follow him as you understand his will. And I sort of, from the fourth grade to this point in my life today, I've watched a movement kind of evolve away from following God. God and evolve into a space where we are replacing formulas with relationship. When we talked about faith, it was always coupled with following the Spirit of God. Now today, faith is tied to a scripture sheet. Oh, I'm dealing with this. Let me, uh, that one. I'll, I'll, and you just claim that one for the next six weeks. I'm dealing with that. Uh, Take that one. Claim that one for the next six weeks. There's never opportunity to be on your knees in the presence of God and say, God, I'm kind of dealing with this. I need you to speak to me in the middle of this. 
What is your will for me right now? You know, his will for you in that moment might be just ignore it because I need you to do this right now. Yeah, but, but God, I'm carrying around this. I don't, he may say, I don't care about that right now. I want you to do this. What is that? That's abiding in him and having the words necessary to be willing and obedient to so that later on, you'll eat the good of the land. But what is the moment right now? So let's go back to this question of did Jesus ever say no? Work with me, church people. Did Jesus heal Lazarus? No. Jesus did not heal Lazarus. Lazarus died of the illness that Jesus did not heal. When Lazarus was sick, they came to Jesus and said, he's sick. We need you to come pray for him. Jesus did not go pray for Lazarus. Jesus said, no, no, I'm preaching here. I'm doing some stuff here. And what happened to Lazarus? He died. And what did they do? They buried him. They had his funeral, and they buried him. Jesus did not heal Lazarus. But what did Jesus do? He raised Lazarus from the dead. So Jesus, in that moment, it wasn't about healing. It was about demonstrating a miracle. Who made that decision? Jesus did. When we have relationship with him, I believe he will tell us what he's going to do today. And when we have confidence that he is doing today in our lives what he said he was going to do, then I'm not going to worry about what he's not doing right now. Let's, let's keep going because I can tell you're like, eh. What about a lady who had a, an issue of blood? How long did she have that? 12 years. Now, I don't know if you've ever dealt with anything, but if I deal with something for three days, I'm like over it. Like, we're, can we be done? Like, no. It's a, it's a no. I'm tired of this. My foot hurts. I don't want my foot to hurt anymore. It's hurt for three days. I mean, it doesn't, but if it did, I'd be done, right? 12 years she dealt with that. 12 years. And then she got in the presence of Jesus, and she touched the hem of his garment, and immediately, immediately, she was made whole. Did she have that experience 10 years before? No. What if she gave up? What if she walked away? What if she quit pursuing? What if she kept what if she quit looking? What if she just stopped? It took 12 years. Well, yeah, but they didn't have a promise of healing. They did have a promise of healing. Psalm 103, I will forgive you and heal all your diseases. That sounds like a promise. She did have a promise. What about the lady who was bent over in the temple on the Sabbath? She's bent over. She was bent over for 18 years. Jesus came to her and he said, shouldn't this daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has afflicted for 18 years, be set free? And he prayed for her in that moment. What happened? She was set free. She stood up straight. How long was she crooked? 18 years. What if she gave up going to the temple on year five? What, what if she wasn't in the right place at the right time? What if she gave up? What if she just said, well, I don't think God moves because he didn't move today. He didn't do today what I wanted him to do today, so I don't think he's going to do anything. What if that was her posture? There was a man who was crippled, and he was in a whole crowd of sick people. They would gather at this pool that was just north of the temple, and it had five porches, and the porches cast shadows so that people who were sick could just be in the shade as they waited for the water to move in the pool. There was this sort of idea that if the water moved, that meant that an angel stepped into the pool, and then they could actually step into the pool and be healed. And whoever got in the water first was the one who they believed would be healed. Now, in Luke, it says that it's, there is a multitude of sick, of sick people. And in that multitude of sick people, there is this man who's crippled. Jesus walks through a multitude of sick people, and goes over to this man and he says, hey, do you want to be healed? The man said, I do, but every time I try to get there, somebody gets in there before I do. So Jesus looks at him and he says, 
Well, then I'll heal you. Stand up, pick up your mat, and be whole. And what did the man do? He stood up, he picked up his mat, and he walked. Jesus healed him. But how many sick people were around? A multitude. Did they get healed that day? No. Jesus walked right past them, healed that man, and walked right out. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who took stripes on his back for our healing, walked right through a multitude of sick people, healed that one, and kept right on walking. Here's my point. We don't need to assume we know things when there is mystery that is not known. Because when we make theologies or doctrines into a box that is not satisfied, we get frustrated when our expectation is not met inside that box, and then we throw away our faith. When you create theologies that actually steal from your faith or cause you to lie, in other words, say something happened that didn't happen, we are not being good stewards of the gospel of God. But when we understand that God does... And we also understand that we have a relationship with him where he will communicate to us what he will do in that moment, in that day. Then we don't have the confusion. You're still looking at me. What about Timothy? If we went to 1 Timothy, the Apostle Paul lines out this command to preachers. He said, hey, preachers, you're not allowed to drink wine. No wine for preachers. You want to know why I live like a monk? That is why. No wine for preachers. That's his command. I, just, I want you to make sure you have this. Timothy was told no wine. But then a couple of chapters later, then the apostle Paul says, oh, but for you, by the way, because you're sick all the time, have a little wine for your often sickness. Now, why didn't he just heal him? I have no idea. And you don't either. And neither does anybody else who wrote a book or anybody else who preached a sermon. We don't know, we can't know, it doesn't matter. Why doesn't it matter? Because when they were having this conversation of the mystery of God, the Apostle Paul was talking to the Romans, and they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're telling me that God's people, the Jews, have been blinded so that we, the people who were not elect, could be elect, and once we all come into the kingdom, the ones who were not elect, who are now elect, then all of a sudden God will unblind the Jews, and he will go back to, like, what? And he says, oh, yes, it's amazing. Romans chapter 11 and verse 33, oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. His judgments are unsearchable and inscrutable are his ways. That means impossible to understand. What, 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 is, what is the point of all this? To confuse us? No, this is the point to focus us. Here's the point. Daily, I live with him. Daily, I walk with him. Daily, I seek to know his will. God, what are you doing today? Let me see today as you see. Let me focus today on what you've called me to focus on. If you're not doing this today, I'm not going to be distracted by this today. Please understand, when John the Baptist was walking the earth, he didn't do one miracle. What was God doing in that season? He was preparing them for the coming Messiah. Because let me tell you something, you can accept Jesus sick or you can accept Jesus healed. It wasn't about miracles in that season. It was about repentance so that they would be prepared for Jesus coming back. But when the word became flesh and dwelled among them, then all of a sudden there's a season of miracles and healings. There was no more fasting. Why? Because the bridegroom had come. But then in the season when the bridegroom was removed, when Jesus ascended back on high, what do we go back to doing? Repenting and fasting. Why? Because we're preparing for his coming. One more, and I think maybe this will convince us. Jesus and John and Peter are having this conversation. It's the end of Jesus' ministry. He's about to go back to his throne. And he looks at Peter and he says, Hey, Peter, um, you're going to go where you don't want to go because I'm going to call you to go there. And you're going to die in ways that you didn't want to die because of where I'm sending you. And Peter receives it. But then he didn't hear Jesus tell John the same thing. And he says, what about him? And then Jesus looks at Peter and he says, if 
It is my will that he remain. What is that to you? You follow me. I don't assume I know God's plan for me by looking at someone else. I know God's plan for me because I spend time in the presence of God hearing how he would lead me. Because the kingdom of God is as if a man scatters seed. I want to make sure I'm scattering the seed that will be seen in the harvest that is promised me. So let me ask you this. Are you looking for a harvest that you haven't actually sown towards? Like, are you believing God to do things that that you're not working any direction towards that particular harvest? Like, if you're saying, God, I'm, I'm really looking for that wife. Like, where is she? What's going on? Are you becoming the man that she's praying for? Are you becoming that person? Let me just pick on the guys for a minute. Because here's the thing. If she's called to follow you, you better step up your game and have such a relationship with Jesus that your relationship is infectious that she actually wants to follow you. She shouldn't have to be forced to follow you, leading your family off a cliff. You should have such a relationship with him that your household wants to follow you. And so if you're just not preparing for the next season of life, if you're not preparing for that marriage by prepping yourself and your relationship with him, you're waiting wasting your time and you are not scattering seed that will become a harvest look she doesn't need a mom she you don't need you fellas you don't need a mom you need a wife like you you don't need somebody just take care of you you need somebody who's going to be an heir together of the grace of life man but the only way that works is if you're following him. If you say, man, I want that promotion. When's that promotion going to happen? Well, do you just want that promotion? Or are you sowing seeds toward that promotion? Are you making yourself better? Are you strengthening your knowledge of what you do? Like that boss, if God's going to remove him and replace her with you or him with you, like if he's going to do that, are you better? I'm serious. What are you going to offer that isn't being offered? How can you uplift that company? How can you bring that department to new heights? How can you lead people like a servant if they're not? Are you the leader? Are you becoming the leader so that God can just lift you up? Like that's scattering seed. Are we scattering seed in those places where we are looking for a harvest? Sometimes we're like, you know what? I just gave up on it. I I just, there's no way. I mean, I just... I'm 26 years old. Life's over. (laughs) There's an advantage we old people have. We remember what it was like to be 25 and helpless. And we also now can look back and say, why was I so anxious about that time in my life? Why didn't I just enjoy the moment? Right? Like, we get so stressed out about, what am I going to be? Just lean on him, you'll find out. Sean, I'm going to be lazy if I listen to you. No, 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 no. No, we'll work you to death. But you won't be stressed out. You might be wore out, but you won't be stressed out. Let's think about Moses. We're talking about a timeline. Let's think about Moses for a minute. In Acts chapter 23 and verse 7, it said, When Moses was 40 years of age, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. When he was 40, at 40, he had been raised in Egypt. In 40, he was living in the wealth of Egypt. And at 40, he'd been educated by Egypt. At 40, life was working out really well for him. And then he came into his heart to go see what his people were dealing with. He looked into their affliction. Sometimes we look into affliction and we want to judge people. But God says when you look into people's affliction, when you look into into what they're dealing with, you should have compassion. Moses went down there and he saw their affliction and he had compassion. And when somebody acted out against one of his brothers, he actually killed him. Now, I'm not promoting violence here. I'm just saying when we see people being mistreated, it should actually bother us. Amen. 
And so he killed him and buried him, and then everybody's like, whoa, you're going to kill us too? And Moses is like, okay, everybody knows what I'm doing. i got to get out of here. So Moses then left and went to the land of Midian. Now let's fast forward. At 40, he goes to Midian. So in his 40s, he gets married. He starts having kids. He's doing his job. Like, he's doing stuff. Now he's 80. He's 80 years old. Verse 30, after 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord visited Moses in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. At 80, the bush lights up and God speaks to him. And God says, hey, I need you to go, like, set your people free. And he says, ah, uh, I can't do that. I'm, I'm 80. I don't have what I need, I don't have the stuff, I don't have what's necessary, I can't actually follow you. You know how many excuses we make for not following God? Well. Blows my mind. Let me just say this, God is not limited by what you do not have, but you will be limited by what you will not give. The kingdom of God is as if a man scatters seed. So God looks at Moses, and Moses saying, I have nothing, standing there with a staff in his hand. God says in uh, Exodus chapter 4 and verse 2, he says, what is that in your hand? Moses said, it's a staff. God said, throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground. Immediately, it became a serpent. Moses thought he had a staff. What he had was a tool for God to use. Sometimes you just need to look around in the garage. What do you have? Sometimes you just need to look around in the corner of the car. What, what, what do you have? I know when I pull up places and I don't have my wallet, I start digging in the seats. I start looking under the car. I'm in the drive through line. I already ordered a Coke. Now what am I going to do? I don't have my wallet. I need a dollar seven. How is this going to happen? Jesus! Where's my coins, Jesus? I just start digging. Show up there at 83 cents. I have 83 cents here. I don't know how they ever balance their cash drawers sometimes, but some way it works out. No, we, we sometimes dismiss what we have. What do you have? The kingdom of heaven is as if a man scatters seed. And then it says, once you've scattered your seed, once you've done the work, it said he goes to bed and rests. Night and day he sleeps. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 24 says, when you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. I pray that our sleep is sweet that the anxiety of the moment doesn't keep us awake, that the fear of what might not happen tomorrow doesn't keep us awake. But in the name of Jesus, as children of God, when we lie down, our sleep is sweet, that we rest knowing that my God is able, my God cares for me, and my God will make a way. And as long as I just abide in him and I follow him and I'm willing and, I, and I'm obedient, I'm going to eat the good of the land. I don't know if that means I'm feasting tomorrow or he'll just help me get by tomorrow. But what I know is God will be faithful. That's what I know. I know God will be faithful. And so he said that first we see this happening. There's a blade. Man, don't give up on the small things. Zechariah 4.10, who dares despise the day of small things? Don't you give up on small things. Don't you give up on the little things, the little habits, the little good that you can do, the little words of encouragement that you can sow. Don't give up on just doing the small things. Yeah, but Sean, it doesn't, I don't care what it doesn't look like. You just do the little things, the right things. Just keep on doing them. Just keep right on doing them. Don't despise where you are right now. Don't despise the opportunities that you have right now, but you have confidence in the small things that you're you're doing knowing that God multiplies. See, here's the thing. This is what blows my mind. We find ourselves where, like, when, when we plant a seed or a small tree, we don't get up the next day expecting it to be a massive oak tree. We don't have that expectation. Why? Because we've watched the process work. But it seems like for some reason, when we follow God, we expect there to be no more process, that every day is just another miracle. God does work miracles. But he also expects process. And it said in this moment when you scatter seed, what are you going to see first? Not the full harvest. You're going to see a blade. That's it. When I cast my seed, what is my expectation for? A blade. That's my expectation because I don't despise small things. I'm not looking for the harvest. I'm looking for a blade. Now once I see that blade, now what am I celebrating? What am I looking for now? Now where's my expectation? Oh, the ear. So, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to get a little bigger. It's going to be a little something else. But don't get impatient. A lot of us, when we see an ear, like, yes, it's it. And you hack it off and it's yours. <laughs> Jesus, send me the right guy. One good looking guy who walks in the door. That's him. He doesn't even love Jesus. <laughs> so 
First the blade, then the ear. Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary in doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Don't quit, don't give up. She was sick for 12 years. Don't quit, don't give up. She was bent over for 18 years. Don't quit, don't give up, don't hack it off early, it's not time. And then it's the full corn in the ear. There was a process. I expect the process to happen as a man scatters seed. And so now in this moment where we find ourselves looking out and now we don't just see a blade, we don't just see an ear, but now we actually see a harvest. What is the call for us? It's the call for us to reach into the world where we find ourselves and harvest what God has placed before us. Whatever you have sown, you will harvest that in front of you. I'm not looking to harvest what you planted. That's your harvest. I'm looking to harvest what I planted. I'm looking for God to grow what I sowed. I'm, my expectation is not created by your harvest. My expectation is created by what I sowed. So I find myself right now in life. I know what I've done. I know what I'm looking for. I know where I've scattered. I know what I've scattered. And I'm looking for God. I'm looking looking for a harvest. I'm looking for him to make a way. I'm looking for him to move. I'm looking him to do this in my house. I'm looking him to do that in my kids' life. I'm looking him to do for this in this church. I know what I've sown. That's what I'm looking for. What have you sown? What are you looking for? If you are looking for a harvest of what you have given, then I promise you, God will make a way. And when God makes a way and that harvest is before you, please, it says at once, he put in the sickle. Why? Because the harvest has come. Church, the harvest has come.